Hey Team Bio, welcome to your screencast about cellular energy. So we're moving from talking about cell structure and organelle structure and function into talking about the two reactions that power living systems, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And in order to uh, really fully kind of grasp what's happening in these two reactions, you need to know a little bit about how energy is stored and metabolized in living systems. Um, so some of these things are already very familiar to you. So you know that lipids are a great long-term energy storage molecule. Um, specifically triglycerides. I'm going to make this a little smaller. This is a triglyceride. Oops, this is a C. Okay, and what makes this molecule so good for uh, long-term energy storage is first, it's a giant molecule. So it holds a lot of chemical energy. Chemical energy is stored in between all of these carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. So there's just a ton of bonds in this molecule. Um, and as a result, uh, there's a lot of energy stored here. Um, it's also very hydrophobic. Um, so this means that when you have a lot of fat aggregated together, it's not collecting and also holding a lot of water. So relative to other hydrophilic um, energy storage molecules, which are going to hold on to a lot more water, they're going to be saturated wa with water in addition to being um, bonded to it like itself, uh, a triglyceride is just going to be fat in an area. Um, okay, so fat, super efficient. Uh, nine calories per gram compared to carbohydrates, which is on average about four calories per gram. Um, it's very large and very hydrophobic, but those properties also come with downsides. So this is a really great long-term energy storage molecule, but because it's so large and it's so hydrophobic, it's hard, it's too big to just burn all at one time. It's not a good kind of daily, um, energy, well, it is used on daily, but it's not a very quick burning energy source. If you burned it all at once, that would be a huge amount of energy released at once. Um, and because it's hydrophobic, it's hard to move around in the body. Um, so carbohydrates is another form of energy storage. This is glucose. You know that glucose is the product of photosynthesis. Um, and so it is actually a very good size for transport and uptake by cells. It's hydrophilic and so it can easily dissolve in water and then be moved around from cell to cell. Um, but it's still a little bit too big for individual uh, instances of cellular work. Um, so it's a little bit easier to use for things than um, lipids and it's easier to move around, but it holds a lot more water so it's not as good for long-term energy storage. And then it's also still a little bit too big for these individual um, needs of the cell. Um, which brings us to this molecule ATP. ATP is how the cell uses uh, small packets of energy um, for individual cellular reactions. It's just the right size um, to do useful cellular work. The structure of ATP is here we have a molecule, uh, an adenosine molecule. So remember we talked about DNA and RNA. They had um, different nitrogenous bases. This adenosine is just a nitrogen base. Nitrogen base A and a sugar. So it really is just a nucleotide, but one of the structural differences between the nucleotides that we use to build our DNA and ATP is that it's attached to three phosphates instead of just one. Now, usually when we burn ATP, um, what we're doing is breaking off the last phosphate, phosphate group from the triphosphate system. And that breaking and then attaching this phosphate to a, another molecule releases energy. And it's just the right amount of energy to do cellular work. So if you imagine kind of making an analogy between lipids, carbs, and ATP, lipids are like your savings account. Oops. 
in the bank. You're hopefully holding some amount of uh, money in savings and not dipping into it um, too often. If you do, you want to recharge it when you can. Um, Your carbohydrates are like your checking account. Money is kind of constantly coming in and coming out. Um, and it's much more fluid than what's happening in your savings. And your ATP is like your cash. You're spending it all the time. Um, it would be silly to keep all of your money as cash. That would just take up too much space. It would be inefficient. Um, but it would also be uh, not very useful to have all your money wrapped up in your savings account. So having a healthy financial uh, balance is similar to having a healthy amount of cellular energy balance. Uh, okay, I don't know if that's a helpful metaphor, but maybe it is. Um, okay, so what is ATP work used to do? We can use it to do a lot of different things in our cells. We can use it to form um, uh, anabolic reactions where we're synthesizing bigger molecules from smaller individual components. Um, So anytime we need to build something in the cell, we're going to use ATP in order to do it. We also use it to transport things. Um, You know that active transport, when we pump things against their concentration gradient, requires the input of energy, and ATP is where we get that energy. So um, spending an ATP molecule is going to cause a conformational change in our transport protein and then move um, solute from one side of the membrane to another. And then we can also use it to do mechanical work in the cell. For example, here is a myosin motor protein and here is an actin filament. So this is what's inside your muscle cells. Um, This is a little motor protein that when a phosphate group from ATP is cleaved off of it, it causes the motor to, um, to move and a whole sequence of these. So this is all, there's a bunch of these motor proteins attached to this actin filament and they're all moving it in this direction and that would be a muscle contraction. Um, So you have this shortening effect and then your muscles contract and yeah. Okay, so these are all the ways ATP is used inside the body. And then there's another way that the cell uh, stores and uses chemical energy and it is called chemiosmosis. Um, So you know what osmosis is. Uh, Osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane, but chemiosmosis is the movement of ions across a semi-permeable membrane. down their electrochemical gradient. And this electrochemical gradient, it's going to make sense in a second. Okay, before we talk about chemiosmosis, I'm going to make a metaphor or an analogy with a hydroelectric dam. So, Here's how a hydroelectric dam works. You have a river, and the river flows from the mountains down to the ocean. But if you put up a dam in the way, you trap a huge amount of water uh, up high. So this is a hydroelectric dam. Um, And this water has really high potential energy. It's energy of position. If we open up the dam and allow water to flow through unimpeded, this potential energy will be converted to kinetic energy and the water will pick up speed and zip down to the ocean. So down here, we would have transformed that energy um, of position to energy of motion. So this would be high kinetic 
is it I E T I C okay but imagine um, in moving this or allowing this water to flow from its area of high potential energy down here to where it's high kinetic energy we put a turbine and as the water moves through the um, the opening in the dam the turbine spins and this spinning motion um, is going to be used to move, uh, basically move some magnets around. And those moving magnets are going to cause, uh, they're going to create uh, an electrical, a current um, in a wire. And then that current of electricity is going to be sent uh, from the, the hydroelectric dam generator um, to your house and you're going to use it to turn on the lights in your house um and we're not going to get into the mechanics of you know how that energy is converted um from uh the spinning of the turbine so this rotational motion to electricity um but know that it's possible because um you can convert energy from one form to another and this dam is what's storing the energy um in creating this high potential energy system Okay, so why am I talking about dams? Well, because the cell membrane is kind of like a dam. It is only permeable to nonpolar things, and polar um, or charged things um, are uh, prevented from passing through by the hydrophobic interior of the membrane. Um, so imagine we have a solution where we have a high concentration of hydrogen ions so protons, essentially, a hydrogen ion is just a single proton. So it has a charge of plus one. So we have a high concentration of hydrogen on one side of the membrane relative to this other side of the membrane, which has a low concentration of um, hydrogen. Now, this is an example of an electrochemical gradient because, first of all, there are a lot more hydrogen ions over here than there are on this side. So this is our chemical gradient. Their hydrogen is more numerous, more frequent on this side of the membrane. This is an, also an electrical gradient because this side of the membrane is more positive than this side of the membrane because, remember, hydrogen ions have a singular positive charge. Okay, so there's energy in this gradient. The, the fact that we have a high uh, potential energy on this side of the membrane um, compared to this side of the membrane means that there's pressure, whoops, um, that pushing um, ions, if they're able to pass um, from one side of the membrane to the other, much like there's pressure on one side of the dam relative to the other that's gonna spin a turbine. Um, the exact same thing, actually, I mean, a very analogous thing happens in our cells. And we have a special um, protein channel in our cells called ATP synthase. And what ATP synthase does is it allows hydrogen to pass through it. And in doing so, that causes a physical rotation of the ATP synthase transmembrane protein. And then that physical um, kinetic energy is transformed into chemical energy binding ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus inorganic phosphate that is um, just around in the, the cytoplasm. Uh, actually, this is happening in the mitochondria, so it's interior in the mitochondria, and it's making ATP. So uh, this, this reaction where we take ATP and we release energy and then we're left with ADP and phosphate, how ADP is recharged back into ATP is through this system. Um, it's powered by chemiosmosis. Um, Okay, so this is going to come back up again, this idea of an electrochemical gradient powering a set of reactions in both cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So if you're kind of confused about what's happening here and how it's similar to here, let's talk about it in class on Monday.
or Tuesday, depending on when your class is.